excited today that we have Dave Rubin uh, from the Rubin Report visiting in Israel. So, uh, hey, David, <laughs> it's so great to have you on the Caroline, Caroline Show. Caroline, it's good to be with you. I'm in full uh, Sinatra 3 a.m. mode right no, now, you, even you, though it's only like 9.15 a.m. here. Well, is that jet lag or is just that you're so excited that you like want to go to sleep? This is, what? this is, I have a long day of doing interviews and we're going to the Knesset later and McCarthy's here and, I've, and I'm interviewing Ambassador Friedman and a bunch of other people. So I have to be dressed well, but I thought if I could start the day a little more casual, uh, we're totally, that might be better. That's totally. So I, just, I hope you I can roll with me. I actually think you look very dapper. Thank you. I, thank I'm you. Not, I don't see the 3 a.m. Yeah. thing. I think... <laughs> I think you're looking good. Yeah. yeah. I am not drunk, which he used to be at 3 a.m. That's right. So, Whoa. But I do have coffee, so that's pretty good. I don't know whether JNS is not advanced enough to offer you the, the, no, the there's Sinatra. Not, there's nothing back there? No. Uh, I, I, there's no Manischewitz back there? Come you on. You know what? I mean, the boss hasn't told me I'm going to have to ask him or, or tell him he's, <laughs> he's not right. We didn't come prepared for Dave Rubin, <laughs> but we'll do our best. So what brings you to Israel, man? So we've wanted, my whole team has wanted to make a trip to Israel for, we've been talking about it for a couple of years, actually. Uh, I've been here, this is probably my fifth time. I actually did uh, my junior semester of college in 1997, which seems like many lifetimes ago, uh, when I was uh, 21 years old, uh, 21? No, I was uh, 19 years old, I guess, uh, at Ben Gurion University in Beersheba. Uh, my sister married an Israeli, got married here. Uh, I've come back uh, maybe two or three times over the years. Um, we were invited to do this Israeli conservative conference with Tikva. Uh, so that was sort of what started it. I'm going to go to Hungary from here and do a few things over there. Uh, and really, I wanted to bring my team and, and tour the country and see the sites and sort of take it in as a Have you had a, a chance tourist. to do much of that? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, this is day five, I think. And we've, uh, we've been in the old city and gotten tours of City of David. And we went down to the Dead Sea. And, you know, we're doing, we're doing all the Jerusalem stuff for the first, you know, five days or so. Uh, we went over to Shiloh and some of the, the settlements. And, uh, you know, we're just kind of taking it all in. We're going to do a little, do little mini documentary after and I'll narrate it and we'll talk about history and and really what fascinates me about this country more than anything else, I mean there's two there's two things I suppose the obvious one of just the fact that the Jewish people are still here after all these years which considering considering all the things really shouldn't be and there's many other civilizations that are long gone or would have given up or whatever so that just as a sort of uh, philosophical concept I think is interesting but what I think is really interesting about modern Israel is the push and pull between modernity and years gone by and that you can have like this incredible tech situation and then also the stories of the bible all happening in the same place in a place that's the size of new jersey not in the friendliest neighborhood without a lot of natural resources and all of those things so there's a story here that i think would be useful for really what's going on all over the world right now which is you know we're watching the collapse i think of sort of liberal western democracies and we're, we're, so we're sort of seeing the end of something, but we're also seeing the beginning of something. The internet's leading us into something new. Nobody really knows what to make of it. I'm not a burn it all down kind of guy. I, I, like, I wanna take the things of the past, the good things, and bring them into the, to the future world. And I think that Israel is really at the epicenter of figuring out how to do that. Maybe, maybe that's what Jews do all the time, in a way, and it's really happening here, you can see it. Yeah, you know, right now it's being pulled apart over that precise fault line. Yeah. You know? uh, and it's been going on for a really long time. I moved here in 91. And uh, and I would say that the push and the pull, uh, uh, Shimon Peres, when he lost the elections to Benjamin Netanyahu in 1996, he had this line. He said, well, the Israelis voted for me, the Jews voted for him, <laughs> and the Jews won. <laughs> and it, there's like this... You know, so the Israeli is more like the startup nation, kind of Tel Aviv. Uh, we want to be part of that global, that global order. And the Jews are like, we want to be in Shiloh. We want to be in Shiloh. You mm -hmm. know, this is where the tabernacle was. We're here because of Shiloh. We're here because of Jerusalem. And and that's what Perez said, who was more left of Bibi at the time. So well, no, that... he said that the that the Jews w voted for Bibi and the Israelis voted for him. So right. the, oh, the, oh, the oh, startup okay. nation guys voted for okay. him. Okay, okay, you got know, it. The proto startup nation yeah. in '96, the got peace it. that were the peace guys, and then they became the startup. Got nation. it, got it. I think I heard it backwards. Right. Okay, right. So he was he was saying that, and and now in the streets of Israel, we're seeing. You know, protest, counter protest, who's democratic, who's not, what is democracy? Mm -hmm. what, and so that's all the stuff playing out in America, too. So yeah. 
How do you look at that? I mean, you've been seeing, I guess, in America, Biden won't meet with Netanyahu because of the that push and pull in a way. You know, what is democracy? Who is democratic? Can you be democratic and Jewish? Can you not be democratic if you're Jewish? Blah, blah, blah. How does it look to you in, in Florida and in America? Yeah, well, I don't know if that's why Biden's refusing to meet with Bibi. I think that's more just Well, we can talk about the, that in a second. Yeah, yeah, like, that's more just, I think, the general state of the radicalness of the Democrat Party more than anything else. I don't think Biden is really thinking about- Well, let's about, move to that yeah. in a minute, but like, yeah. how, does, how does the whole push and pull of that of the struggle that we're really suffering through in Israel. How does it play out? Yeah, it was interesting because I mentioned to you at dinner last night, it's not being talked about that much in America. You know, one thing that I think is really hurting America terribly, uh, well, it goes without saying, I suppose, the corporate media is horrific. I right. mean, to say they're horrific, Ours too. like it, it could not be worse. These people cannot say anything true if their life <laughs> depended on it. If you open up the New York Times, pretend that the word not is at the beginning of every sentence and you would be far closer to the truth than anything that the New York Times is putting out there. And I mean that with CNN, Washington Post, everything is anonymously sourced. They lie the lawn, you know, they launder the lies basically through anonymous leaks and then they write the story. The story then gets put, uh, you know, across the web and just, it's just an endless, awful, evil lying machine. One of the things I say all the time is, you know, we don't expect, I don't think Americans expect, and I certainly don't think Israelis expect, a really great mainstream media. We really don't. We would accept very little and be okay with it, but they are unbelievably horrible. So I, I mentioned that related to your question because we're, we're not really talking about it in America. There was maybe two days at the height of the protests. So here it was probably about three weeks ago at the real height of the protests where there was a little bit of coverage on CNN. There's been some stuff in the New York Times and that sort of thing. But it's not something that the average American is talking about at all. Even on my show, I really only talked about it once or twice. But I, I also knew I was coming here and I wanted to kind of see it firsthand. Uh, and, you know, when I got here on, uh, I think it was Thursday morning, uh, Governor DeSantis, and I, I am a Floridian now, the other promised land, as I call it. Right. Uh, he was here and one of the Israeli press members asked him about it. And he gave the right answer as a politician, which was, you know, Israel is a vibrant democracy. There are going to be people protesting on both sides and figuring out what the country is and what the laws are and, and what the nation stands for. And it's not for every political leader on the outside world to impose their view. That's not in line with, I think, what the Biden administration would love to do, because obviously some degree of the, the iciness has to do with they, they're not happy with Bibi's position on the judicial reform situation, but they're not happy with Bibi's position on anything. I mean, he believes in his country. He believes in independence. And unfortunately, this administration is not interested in that. They want they want people that will just follow So you don't them. think that Americans really have any, are not clued into no. the stuff that we're scope locked on? No, not really. I don't, I don't think, I think unfortunately there's nothing other, we have culture wars and we have, uh, you know, insider politics. So we have now 2024 politics rolling in. So it's all about Trump bashing DeSantis or whatever nonsense is related to that. And then kind of like a little bit of, you know, the not the jockeying between Biden breaking down mentally and my God, how are they going to get rid of Kamala? Because everyone knows, you know, she's not the brightest. Um, so there's a lot of that. And then I would say there's general culture war stuff. So it's, you know, where are the drag queens today and, and that kind of thing. But there is there's very little. I, I don't. And in, in some respects, I would say that's probably good for Israel. Like, I think it's better for Israel in general when people aren't talking or thinking about Israel. Just go about your business, you know. So. Let's just walk away from the headlines a little bit, because you're yeah. right. I mean, I think it was Lee Smith who said it to me the first time. It's like there's a difference. You know, they used to be biased. Now they're mobilized, right? I mean, that that's that, the big, that's an excellent that's framing, a big yeah. difference. So yeah. We were used to the bias. We can figure it out. But when they're completely mobilized, it's just it's the same thing here, unfortunately, yeah. uh, and in a big way. And it's quite devastating, which is why we have JNS, for instance. Yeah. But um, so just for you i mean you come from an you come from the progressive left i guess yeah, or yeah. maybe it wasn't so progressive when you were on the left it, I mean, it wasn't completely bananas but i was part of that and i was on the young turks network which is a far left network so yeah i come from that so thing. but but israel was always sort of a it was kind of a wedge issue for you from the beginning, mm -hmm. wasn't it? So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. So I just quick bio on me. I was born in Brooklyn in 1976. My bris actually was on July 4th, 1976, the bicentennial of America. And, and so there's some, yeah, so there's something very powerful there, I suppose. Um, but I grew up in a, in a New York, Long Island Jewish household. 
uh, that was liberal in the sense of the liberals that you grew up around right. and that most sane people grew up around. JFK liberals, Ed Koch liberals, Daniel Patrick Moynihan liberals, these were people who believed in free speech, who believed in civil liberties, who many of them, I mean, how many Jews were basically leading the ACLU as they were, as they, right, as they were stopping, as they were allowing the, the neo-Nazis to march through Skokie, Illinois. So there was a, a, a very strong, good liberal tradition. And, and I think most Jews, sort of mid, middle, at, let's say conservative or something in the middle Jews, uh, the second religion was the Democrat Party. Right. And I think the reason that so many Jews are completely bamboozled right now is they cannot believe what has happened to the Democrat Party. The idea that they could be Republicans is so beyond, it, it was so ingrained in them that the Republicans are somehow evil. I mean, this is, you gotta give the Democrats or the, or the progressives and the radicals a lot of credit here. They have so scared half the country from thinking that freedom and liberty and you Were know you independence. When you, like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it was it was extremely hard. My my journey of getting out of the left, and there were a couple seminal moments in that. The most famous one is an interview I did with Larry Elder, who's a conservative. He happens to be black. I always say he happens to be black because it's not his defining. A principle, his skin color, uh, and I was a lefty, and we were talking about systemic racism, and we got into it, and he just kind of bludgeoned me with facts, and and you can sort of see me realizing I it in real, it last yeah. Night. So you I can see it, yeah, you can see it happening motor. in real time, and uh, you know the part that you can't see on that video because it's now been seen two or three hundred thousand, two or three hundred thousand, two or three hundred million times. Wow, uh, I'm not sure the coffee kicked in yet. Um, You're doing is, good. Is thank you, thank you. Um, is that when I, at that time, I wasn't fully independent yet. I was on Aura TV, which was Larry King's digital network. We had a big staff inside. And when the interview ended, I walked into the control room and I had like two or three producers that came up to me and immediately said, Dave, you know, don't worry, we'll edit that out because it wasn't live. It wasn't aired live. It was live to tape. And, you know, sometimes you have those moments in life where you do the right thing and you're not even sure why. And I immediately said, no, no, if, if I'm an interviewer, then I can't take out the one real What's part of the interview. What's amazing is they said, We'll take it out. Like it was, it was taken it for was granted. Default. Yeah. You know. Well, in their way, I suppose in their minds, they were trying to protect me, which is, I, you know, at some level what a pro uh, producer's, you know, supposed to do. Um, but I left it in. And then within two days, I saw what the reaction was. And a lot of people suddenly were saying, wow, you know, Dave kind of listened. Let's see where that journey goes. And then from there. I started talking to Ben Shapiro. I started talking to Dennis Prager. Uh, I started talking to Jordan Peterson. I mean, I can go on with the list of names. And I found, generally speaking, it's not even conservatives because I don't because Jordan's not even a traditional conservative. I would say he's more of a classical liberal, which is, which is what most Democrats used to be. That there was sort of a place for government, and they didn't, you know, they want they were sort of more socially liberal, I'd say. Um, but I started talking to these people and I found them to be more pleasant and generous of spirit and kind. And, and they also had thought through a lot of the issues. I think what's happened to a lot of liberals and I think a certain, to a certain extent, a lot of secular Jews in America mm -hmm. is that it's been like pretty good. It's really been pretty good for, for 50 years or something like that. And in some cases it's been extraordinarily good. I mean, Jews have been an unbelievable success in America and that, that success has led them to not, and, and a lot of people beyond Jews, the success of America has led a lot of people to have such a cozy life that they haven't really thought through any of the issues. And I think that this is a problem that liberals suffer from way more than conservatives. Conservatives, generally speaking, if you ask conservative, what do they believe and why do they believe it? Usually they can figure out a couple things. But I just wanted to bear down for a yeah. second on the, because uh, I, I was reading, you know, in, when I was preparing for this, I was reading about how you were saying that, you know, if for you it just sort of was intuitive that of course anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Yeah. And yet, you know, so you're on the you're on the progressive left. You're on the Young Turks network, yeah. and they're pretty anti-Israel. So, yeah. no, radically and ridiculously. Okay, I so I was, but yeah. I mean, you know, at that time, I don't know whether you realized how radical <coughs> no, and ridiculous it was. But did what was your how did did you feel uncomfortable? I mean, how so there's did a it, there's a video that people can find. It's about a two hour live stream where it was, I think, the summer of 2014 during so the Gaza War. Mm -hmm. And I was debating, I think, five people on camera. Two of them were my bosses. They brought in another guy off camera. And none of them had any idea what they were talking about. They had no idea about the history. They had no idea about the partition plan or, you know, that. And you that, knew. And and, you yeah. And I knew all of these things and I knew the history. 
Uh, and I knew why it was ridiculous to keep calling it the West Bank and an occupation rather than Judea and Samaria. And they had no idea that Jordan had, you know, the, the old city before 1967. Like it was just in, it was just like a litany of insanity. But but they are what progressives are, which is overly emotive. And they just believe that if everyone would just do what they want when they wanted them to do it, then the world would be a better place. So you can watch that video. And in it, it's two hour like and it's just nonsense. And And interestingly, afterwards, except for the main guy, uh, whose name need not even be worth mentioning, virtually everyone that I was on camera with came up to me after basically saying that they didn't know what they were talking about, but it's just like the, progress the progressive position. Israel is the occupiers, their power, you have to fight against power. Like there was no principle to it, no knowledge of history or anything. And I, now I see how consistent that is when it comes to the left with virtually every issue. It has nothing to do with reality or it has nothing to do with the human condition or history or philosophy. It has to do with how you feel about a given something and how quickly you can make everyone else feel I the same way. I think it makes it, it's more herd mentality almost or, or like this organization that everybody has to be a part of because I was talking about it last night with my husband after after we after I came home from dinner with you and I was saying you know it's so and and watched your sort of come to Jesus moment with Larry yeah. Elder right yeah, I yeah. Mean, not Jesus but you know come to Moses yeah. anyway so <clears throat> he I said to him you know it's really weird we, we've been seeing this outpouring of racism against Sephardic Jews against religious Jews by the left in Israel um, and 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 it just shows how instrumental the concept of racism really is. Mm -hmm. And it also came before in your in your Larry Elder thing. You know, the vast you have so many black people who are killed every single year in Chicago. With seven hundred thirty six uh, people were killed last year, and that's going down five percent over twenty twenty one, which is insane, right. right? And the vast majority of them are young black men who are killed by other bl young black men. And so when you talk about Black Lives Matter, this is fun. This is, yeah, this is a fundamental uh, just disconnect. Just a, a total <clears throat> lie. Yeah. And I mean, they don't care. And uh, again, your interview with Larry Elder, he said, a white young white man, excess deaths are from car crashes and excess deaths for young black men from shooting, uh, which isn't like just get your head around that concept and here you know so but the left in america you know to the extent that they're at all aware of what's happening in israel they're supporting the israeli left and the israeli left has just i mean just yesterday there was this woman i, I spoke at this mega rally thursday night yeah. for judicial reform yeah. and another woman who spoke there is a fashion model named natalie dadon whose family comes from morocco dadon is a mm -hmm. is a name you know that's that is morocco tunis and so they used the she was denied service at a cafe in Tel Aviv yesterday because he didn't want her kind in the cafe after she spoke at the rally. You know, this woke or whatever Tel Aviv member of the resistance against the government mm -hmm. and it's totally racist. Yeah. And uh, and, and there's no shame about it, but the tendency, but they're all on the left together so that the people who don't care about racism in the United States, but operate under that banner, you know, they're allied with people in Israel who operate under the same banner, but it's all really just about leftism, just like feminism isn't about women's rights. You know, it's no, a, feminism like, suddenly is about having men beat women in wrestling, which is an odd position for the feminist to take. But I would say from a, from a Jewish perspective, um, you know, the problem that I think the left in America has with Jews that maybe is a little bit different than what's going on here with your left is that the left hates success. They hate people that can right. survive and thrive when things are difficult. They love victims. So the story of the Jews, say, pre-Israel, the left would have been all about the Jews, right? Like they would have loved, like the, uh, not loved people going to the ovens, but like love, that, that would have been well, a cause that they would have been Everybody loves for. dead Jews is right. what Daryl Horn right, wrote right, right, in the right. book, right? right. It's so, very true. Right, so you can either be, you know, you can be loved and basically dying or you can be hated and, and standing. And that's what Israel represents. So the left, they have no use for the Jews anymore. It also doesn't fit the intersectional calculator. They need oppressed groups. And it doesn't make sense that a group that has been pogromed and and holocausted and kicked out of inquisition and all of those things, <laughs> I, I verb it, and, and kicked out of all of these countries, that somehow wherever Jews go, 
we figure out a way to be successful and to, to help societies thrive. Everywhere that Jews are, the few places that Jews are in the world are pretty good places. Still, that is just a fact. The places that kick Jews out, not so good. It, like, this is a fact. So whatever that magic is all about, and that's partly why I'm here and why I'm interested in the history and that push and pull that we talked about, that's what the, that's what the left hates more than anything else. It's not a, they, it's not a traditional, it's like, true. we hate you. The average left college leftist, let's say, doesn't hate Israel and is for BDS because it comes from sort of like some sort of like bizarre uh, religious notion like they don't accept Jesus as their savior. It really has nothing to do with that because, you know, the left hates religion in general. They really do in America now. Um, it has much more to do with you can't, they can't fit the Jews in any box that makes sense. And they love boxes. If you're black, you got to think this. If you're gay, you got to think this. And if you're a Jew, you got to think this. And they don't know what to do with that. Uh, but again, I think being a, a problem for that system rather than just a piece of the system is probably much better so, for us. So for you, I mean, a lot of a lot of Jews who grew up in a liberal household, Jewish liberal household, I'm just thinking about my neighborhood in Chicago, which is yeah. a bastion of, of the left, uh, and um, they just became woke. I yeah. mean, I was looking recently, I found myself checking out the Facebook pages of a lot of the people who graduated uh, from this Jewish day school with me in, in Chicago. And so many of them had anti-Zionist stuff on their banners. <laughs> I and you're like, going to say most of them are no longer the same gender, which, right. which well, is probable too. I, no, actually, I don't, I didn't notice that, but uh, <clears throat> patience, we're patience. older, we're older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We may be too old for that. Right. But um, they hate Israel. I mean, yeah. we grew up Zionists and now you, you have a lot of people with uh with very very hateful it's, it things. It really is just because they don't believe in anything. They, but they what about you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. why didn't why did that not resonate with you when you were on the left? Um, I mean, I, there was some of it. I think was probably built in. I mean, my my family in terms of religion was conservative, so we went to a conservative temple. We did Shabbat every Friday night. Like my parents were very involved in that. Again, I went to Israel when I was in college. My sister married an Israeli, who I ended up. Uh, starting my company locals right. with um, so I've always had an affinity for this country my the guy who built my house by coincidence in LA was an Israeli Mara half Moroccan half Iraqi and really welcomed me into that community so even in LA which has the worst of the worst of the sort of like you know lefty Jew woke whatever um, in LA I was really with I like to hang out with Israelis mostly uh, I, they're zest for life and like they were sane and I think and politically got it and all of those things um, so I guess I had some built-in pieces to defend myself from that. I also, uh, you know, I'm a realist, I think, in a way, and, and I'm not, I don't think I can be caught up in just sort of, you know, wokeness, it's not real. It is no. this imagined, everyone is, it's not fun or good or spiritually worthwhile to be a victim all the time. It's, it's miserable. Uh, I've had a lot of struggles in my life personal struggles, financial struggles, all sorts of things. And I think the thing that is, uh, that I'm most proud of is that I've conquered those things for the most part. They're not, not, they're not all fully conquered always. And the demons of your past can always magically reappear. But I mean, I've gone through things and I've built things and done good things. And, uh, and I've been rewarded for that as well because I didn't just sit there and say that I'm a victim. And again, that's, that's so connected to, to the Jewish story, I think. You know, I've had so many conversations about this, just like in the last three or four days. I don't know why, but um, oh, it's, it's Tippi Livni, who uh, was our foreign minister. Mm -hmm. So she had this concept that she didn't want to talk about Zionism anymore because it was not in, right? And so around 2006 or so, she and the, uh, the uh, consul general at the time in New York decided that what they wanted to do was hire a bunch of PR companies to rebrand Israel. So we weren't going to talk about Zionism anymore. We were going to talk about victimhood mm -hmm. because that was the way to latch on to the PC mm -hmm. thing where if you're a victim, you're good. And if you're if you're not a victim, then you're bad. So they started this whole um, uh, where we suffer from terrorism, we're victims, we're this, we're that. Um, and. Uh, it totally flopped, you know. Oh, and we're gay friendly, but then yeah. everybody accused us of pinkwashing, right? right? I mean, like we couldn't right. do, like we couldn't be progressive. Which again, they would only so, do with Israel, only so, with Israel. You know, so, these idiots, you know, gays for Palestine is very different than Palestine for gays. Well, there is none. 
the, the other side precisely, doesn't exist. So, but but uh, you know that that has been this this concept that we want to be victims too. Let's show you know let's make the Holocaust yeah. now the 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 genesis sort of or the defining the, the moment core of, yeah, of, yeah. A Z- of a Jewish identity in America. And yeah. that's also not working out so good. I mean there is this desire to put aside our achievements and yeah. you know. I, I just want nothing to do with it. It's as simple as that. And I suppose that, you know, I've spent these first four days here in Jerusalem. I'm gonna spend the, another week now in Tel Aviv and then sort of bouncing around that area and I'll guess I'll get to see the juxtaposition of the two major cities in Israel and politically what's going on and culturally and everything else. I have to say, uh, even though I'm largely secular in my own life, um, it has been extremely refreshing being in Jerusalem. And I did a Shabbat with an Orthodox family when it was absolutely wonderful. And I took my my entire team who are all non-Jewish and everybody absolutely loved it. And to see the hustle and bustle of the Shuk before Shabbat and that there's a, there's a cultural affinity that's tying people together. I mean, Israel still, even, the, even if that's fraying to a degree and, and the, the sort of secular and religious thing, which is, it's been a problem always here in essence, really. I, when I was here in uh, 97, that was when BB, it was Bibi's first term mm-hmm. back then. So I was here for six months. There was not one terrorist incident. It was incredibly safe. And that was when I think a, a certain degree of the religious secular stuff was popping up because suddenly people felt safer. So now they could focus on their, exactly their internal right. problems, we don't right? Have, we don't, we're not being attacked from outside. We eat each other. Up right. So look, look, I, I hate to tell you, but uh, there will be further attacks from the outside and maybe that'll bring the country together again. And, you know, there's, again, that, that's another type of push and pull that always will happen here. How about you know? American Jews? Where, yeah. where do you see, I mean, we look at them and we're like, oh my. <laughs> You know, huh. what are, how do we help them? Can we, what should we, you know, do they want us? Like, <clears throat> do they really hate, th- like, what about the, is the anti Semitism that's rising a yeah. lot in the United States? Are, are do you see, are you connected? I'm do pretty you- sure, I'm pretty sure that if I was an Israeli, uh, if I moved here tomorrow, that you I should, would be, by the way, you'd be welcome. Well, I'm in, the free, like, you, I'm in the free state of Florida. But which, you could broadcast here at, that, at our fine studio. I appreciate here. that, yeah. and it's very possible mm-hmm. once, you know, if it, it, the thing is Florida will be the last state to go down. So I will fight for Florida as long as humanly possible, <laughs> okay. and then we'll see what happens after that. But, you know, look, I started in Cali, so I've already you made it 3,000 miles, and then it's only another, what, 10,000 miles? 5,000. 5,000? 5, yeah. Is it 5,000 across the... Yeah, about, uh, yeah, about yeah. 5,000. Okay. Um, I think if I was an Israeli and watching what was going on with America and Jews and whatever, I mean, I think I would mostly think, well, the best thing we can do is just fight for our country and our beliefs the best way that we can and and model a pride in history and all of those things, a pride in history and the present that maybe will be attractive to some of those people. People sometimes find a way back. And I think a lot of, you know, it might be possible that we've lost like just an incha- entire generation of of liberal Jews. It's a failure of liberalism, which you know is very depressing. My first book was a full defense of classical liberalism. It was, I, I mean, I think I was the guy. Nobody was even saying cla- the phrase classical liberalism in America for like thirty years, and then I really started going out there trying to make the distinction between progressivism and liberalism. I don't really describe myself as a liberal anymore because it's not um, the words are and the language is so mucked up at this point that it just doesn't work for anybody. Um, so what I always say to people is I'm sort of like a wide tent conservative, or some people call it a small C conservative, something like that. I'm really a freedom conservative. What's happening in Florida that that is the the that well first off I think that's the blueprint for a successful America. It might be a blueprint for a successful Israel as well. But I don't think there's anything for for Israel or Israelis to do that will somehow fix what's going on with American Jews. I think that the best that you can do is, is do the best that you can here, and then hopefully some of them will start seeing it. Maybe you can, you know, there's always people, you know, offering trips to Israel for young people, so you could keep doing that. But I, so try to connect them in some way on that front. But I don't think it's about like just sort of outreach programs or nonprofits or those things. I just don't think it works anymore. I think it was a time there might be better ways to leverage social media or that sort of thing, but I think it's really like, the thing is at the end of the day, people really do like success. So when people see that Jews are thriving despite all those things, for a certain set of people, it turns into anti-Semitism or something because it's like, damn, they shouldn't be able to do that and I'm jealous of it. That really is what it is. The whole Kanye thing, he really was just saying, I'm jealous of Jews. I know. That's all he was saying, I'm jealous of Jews. He basically did say it. I'm pretty sure he said, I'm jealous of them. 
Well, all right, so instead of jealousy, you can be jealous for a while and you can wallow in that forever, or you might be like, boy, so there so might it, be something to learn from that community. admire it. I mean, yeah. I think that the anti-Semitism is, is very much about how you, how you handle success. If you're, if you're envious of success, then you're an anti-Semite, or your tendency is to be an anti-Semite, and if you admire it, then your tendency is to feel great about the Jews, which is, I think, in a way, how Donald Trump looks at Jews. Yes, I think you that's know, exactly. He, he's very, he, he admires and respects people who are successful, which is why he likes Jews. You know, it, yeah. it really is like a New York thing in a way. You know, his, but now New York has changed so much. But I mean, I think, yes, the dividing line is how you look at success. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I th look, Donald Trump also has, you know, a Jewish daughter now. Right. I mean, Ivanka, we're, we're quite friendly with Ivanka and Jared, and they're wonderful, wonderful people. I mean, they're, Children are growing up in a, I, would, I suppose, a modern Orthodox right. household and go to Jewish school and all of those things. So I think he I, he does have a, an actual affinity now that maybe goes a little bit beyond uh, beyond just purely the success part. But I'll take that. Right. I'll take the success part. That's pretty good. But now America is abandoning under the left. They're abandoning meritocracy, which has also been the recipe for success for Jewish Americans. Yeah. And so now, a, it, you know. it, it is the word systemic is overused. It is a systemic problem. It is now in the system. Right. Meaning that the anti Semitism just, that, well, is in the system. I would say the, the destruction of meritocracy. So, wokeness, the, which is connected to the anti Semitism, it's in the system, meaning we literally are having laws now put in place that we will punish people based on their skin color. During COVID and vaccines, I was I was I was anti mandate the entire time, and personally, I'm anti I'm anti vax in that I did not get vaccinated, and I'm very happy that I did not get vaccinated. Am I going to be allowed to walk around Israel today? If it's, I say okay. That? It's, it's okay. It's I'll, I'll be it's okay. okay. Um, but you know, the, in places like Seattle and Portland, they were literally giving out vaccines based on skin color. Literally, Harvard discriminates uh, against Asians because there were too many Asians there. Right. We've already destroyed meritocracy. By the way, Harvard discriminating against Asians is the same way Harvard used to discriminate against Jews. Because oh, they, they were do too, it again, right? And they would gladly do it again, and they are doing it again. And hopefully, hopefully, Jews will realize that Harvard. I mean, well, not even Jews. Everyone in America should realize that that a Harvard education is not worth the paper that it's printed on. So, so as as meritocracy as a Harvard, guys, as a Harvard are you alum, a Harvard gal? I agree. Yeah. Oh yeah. well. Uh, yeah. That is, which is so unfortunate, right? Like well, I look, have, when Ahmadinejad spoke in Colombia in two thousand and seven, I wrote yeah, a column yeah, and yeah. I said. As a Columbia grad, that's where I went undergrad, I said, I will not hire a Columbia alumni who cannot prove that he was actively protesting against this stuff. Yeah, well, you good know? for you doing that back then. I lived on the Upper West at the time, so I remember when he well, was up there. My and when, when it, <laughs> well, that's very sad for me. I mean, I lived on the Upper West. I lived basically in Seinfeld country. But how did was... you, did you, were you aware of, you know, this guy <sighs> saying, no Holocaust, we want to annihilate Israel? Speaking at Columbia. Well, University. Columbia was about 30 blocks north, and in New York, that's a lot of blocks that, to so walk. You, you really, really you, you only side. go, well, no, that's the heart of the Upper West. But, yeah, but, but see, for me, it started but, on 96th Street. On, so no, so that's funny. <laughs> it's funny how New York City works because, so I lived on 83rd and right. Amsterdam, and to me, 72nd to 96, that was my thing. But I and very then we rarely were went, right, right? So I very rarely went above basically the, the southmost point for you. But I mean, so I guess the question that I was really trying to get at was American Jews. Yeah. You think that the the fact that it's in the system now is going to wake people up? Or do you think that we've lost a generation and they're just too <clears throat> far gone? Or I think how we, do you we, look we, at well, that? I mean, do you see an I'm awakening so in Florida? I know that there's an awakening yes, of there's American absolutely. Jews. I will tell you this. I, so I moved to, I live in South Miami in the suburbs now and florida obviously is flourishing and it's incredible 1200 people a day almost a million people have moved to florida in the last uh, three years um you know desantis is just one thing after another just doing ev virtually everything right i have one or two policy disagreements with him it's it's sort of irrelevant if, well, if you want to talk about it that's fine but what I, so i'm walking my dog one day and you know the neighbors now in florida the original floridians they're seeing this influx of people and they're nervous because it's like wait a minute all these people are coming from cali in new york Right. And, Democrats. And, it's like, and well, they're afraid they're going right. to vote the same way. Now, what I'm finding from all the new people and because we're, usually if I go out, a certain set of people know me and I meet all these people and everyone's like, no, you know, I fled Cali and I fled Connecticut, New York, and I'm voting Republican for the first time in my life. And I couldn't do. But well, they actually they don't have to whisper. I'm doing my I'm doing my L.A. version of it. Mm -hmm. In L.A., they were always whispering to me at the supermarket in Florida. They can speak freely and, and it's all OK. But connecting this to the Jewish thing, I'm walking my dog one day, a neighbor comes up to me and, and he says, oh, Dave, heard, heard you moved in. I'm a big fan. I watch you on Gutfeld all the time, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and he says, and he says, I'm Jewish, and I got to tell you, you know, all the temples here are, are just so woke. And he said, you know, I never was even that connected to my Jewishness, but I know what's going on there is wrong, and we need a better temple down here, and what's going on, and have you thought about any of this stuff, and blah, blah, blah. All that being said, I'm working on getting Dennis Prager to flee Los Angeles. You know, he runs. That he, would be he's huge. Not a, he's not a rabbi, but he runs high holiday services for hundreds and hundreds of people. That's where I went for the last couple of years for uh, Yom Kippur and, and Rosh Hashanah. And I'm really trying to get him to come down there and do that. So what, to directly answer your question, what I think is going to happen, there's no future for Jews in New York. I, I hate to say it. There's no future for Jews in L.A. and certainly no future for Jews in San Francisco. There'll be people who remember something about their grandma being Jewish or something like that. But but the woke thing is here to destroy everything, and, and, it, and it is doing it. Th that's the thing. I wrote about this in my last book. You have to. Do you, do you remember the original Alien movie, 1977? Sigourney, I was too Sigourney Weaver. Too scared. It's a great movie. I was too movie. scared to watch. So it. there's a, there's a really powerful scene. So you know the the basics of the movie is the alien gets on the ship, and you know there's 20 crewmen when the thing starts, and it just systematically is killing everybody. And now there's only like four people left, and there's a, a doctor on the ship, and Sigourney Weaver is the main character, and the doctor on the ship, who you later find out is a, actually an android. <laughs> they're they're talking with Sigourney, and he's telling her in the midst, it's killed everybody on the ship. They they know they're all going to die basically, but the doctor admires the alien because he thinks the alien is the perfect creature. It, it's merciless. It does what it wants to do. It, whatever it wants to do, he ad, he doesn't admire what it's doing, but he, he admires its ability it's to yeah to to accomplish what its goals are. And I think that's what we have to look at. You know, we can't just say they're, they're idiots and they're morons and the, the workers are stupid. No, they're determined. They are unbelievably determined. You look at what, how much they have destroyed and how quickly they've destroyed it. Now we could talk about the long march through the institutions, and you probably saw it at Columbia to some degree way before a certain set of people and all of those things. But if you just look at it when it's when it's been hyper fueled on steroids of the last seven or eight years, they've destroyed pretty much everything. They really have. Uh, the schools, the, all of the, the big tech companies, what Elon's dealing with at Twitter with activists within the company still trying to take him down. So I think you have to acknowledge that they've destroyed a lot, but they haven't destroyed everything. And I, will think, I think that the places that will go solidly red, say Florida, Texas, Tennessee, uh, South Dakota, Iowa, like a couple other places, but a few of these places, there aren't many Jews and a lot of Jews aren't going to move there. But I would say Texas, Florida, for the most part, and a couple other places, that's where Jews in America will be. And, and that will be it. And then and then there'll be Israel. And, you know, so let's talk. About There's just no future. If, if you're a Jew right now and you live in Los Angeles and you send your kids to public school, they are being brainwashed into oblivion. They are learning the complete reverse of – if they're learning anything about the Middle East, they're learning a complete reversal of history true. on top also of the Chicago. fact that uh, – right, on top of the fact of that they will be taught to hate themselves over their traditions and all of those things. So there's just no future there. You can pretend there is and, like, you might be able to survive. I, I don't think it's that they're going to – like, I don't think we're going to Nazi Germany level uh, situation. But, you know, when, when there was the – a year and a half ago in, in the spring when there was – uh, some there was a Gaza war yeah, here, little, yeah. and then and then it started flaring up in L.A. and in some other places. Oh, you're talking about in 21. In yeah. 21, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jews didn't feel safe in Los no. Angeles. I was in Los Angeles. That was actually even though I didn't move for another eight months because I did fight hard for the recall and I campaigned with Larry Elder, which what a beautiful ending to that story, or, right. or at least full circle with that story of Larry Elder. You know, he wakes me up seven years before. Next thing you know, I'm campaigning with the guy in California. Uh, but that, in May, I think it was, of 21, that's mm -hmm. when I first was like, I want out of here. Like, I just realized officially there was no future there. Then with the recall, it sort of gave me five-month cushion to just fight for something. Three days after the recall, I was actually audited by the state. That was the day that I put my house for sale because they also love political retribution. So, right. Yeah. Right. No, it, it's so – when you when you're looking at the situation, Israel, um, American Jews, and – I mean, you don't, you just sort of say, Israel, you do your thing, and the more you do your thing, the more helpful you'll be. Like, you don't try yeah. to fix everything. Don't try to convince these people that you're victims like they want to no. be. Don't. No, success. Like, first off, it, it just, at a, at a huge, what would I, if, 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 if I was looking at each nation as a friend, like, what kind of people do you want to be around? Do you want to be around people that are endlessly whining and crying and complaining and, oh, my God, something happened to me and blah, blah, blah? No. Or do you want to be around people that are innovating and uh, 
and fighting for their existence in, and a, in a positive in sense. And believe something beautiful. Be, yeah, and I think that that's a much better compelling story. And I can tell you that uh, having built locals with my brother-in-law, Asaf, who, you know, when he first came to America 12 years ago or so, you know, he spoke English, but but very, he still has a very thick Israeli accent, but his English wasn't great now. Now he's an incredible speaker, and I've taken him to all sorts of big events where he speaks in front of hundreds of people, and we've done major investor, you know, we've gone to Silicon Valley. Is he Valley. here with you now? Uh, he'll be here in a couple of days, actually. Mm-hmm. You'll meet him uh, on Thursday. Uh, and he's incredible, absolutely incredible, and married my sister, three kids, uh, and, and successful and doing all those things. Um, but, you know, we'd sit around you know, big investor tables, go, you know, going to San Francisco and trying to, when, before San Francisco was a full zombie apocalypse. And he would pitch and he would always talk about being from Israel and what Startup Nation was all about and all of those things. And now that we're t- he's pitching to lefties who probably don't have the most affinity to Israel. But I never got the impression that anyone um, was, was sort of anti-Semitic or, or even anti-Israel in, in the sense of, oh, here's a guy sitting here who's telling you who he is and why he's here. He's building something good. And I think that actually defeats a lot of the hate. You know, but it's also it ha- it's also a bit of a mental shift, right? Like two generations after the Holocaust, that we all have to have a mental shift, that that can't be the defining We had uh, what, uh, and another thing that I was thinking about when, when you were talking at dinner last night was that you're talking sort of about the balkanization of the United States, that you're going to have the red U.S. and you're going to have the blue U.S. And the blue U.S., you know, they made... They may be in charge for a long time, and they can do a lot of things that are harmful to the red U.S., yeah. but in general, I mean, it just means that the United States is going down. It's basically, I mean, no matter what, <laughs> if a balkanized America is yeah. not, it's well, not it's the not, America that we've known. No, it's not the America that we've known, but it's actually perhaps more in line with the America that the founders intended. You know, the founders intended, the federalist system was intended that virtually everything that would go on in your day-to-day life would be dealt with by the states. That was, the, that was really the whole idea. The federal government has become way too big, way too powerful. I think you're right that the blue states will never stop. I mean, the problem with going back to a fully federalist They're society, they, they are relentless. So the average, so let's say, let's say literally tomorrow, Florida and Texas and Tennessee were like, all right, we're, we're getting out. We're seceding from the union. Like, that's it. We're separatists. We're going. Now, that's not what I want. I I want the idea of the United States of America. But the problem with even that concept, if it went that far, and by the way, there's a movement for that in Texas right now, the blue states will never stop. They will always be encroaching. They will want the resources and the money and whatever else that they can get off the red states. If, if and Texas separated, also, Texas isn't going to... the suppression. I mean, they also... Well, of course. They'll, right. Well, then they'll basically say, you know, these countries are all, you know, fascist dictatorships and all of that stuff. Systemically racist. And all of that thing. Now, the irony is there's only... Uh, two ways that people move. They either move into a state or out of a state. And people are fleeing California and New York, which are blue, and they're going to Texas and Florida. So, like, you don't even have to debate the policies. It's just like, which way are people moving? There is nobody that suddenly was living in Florida during COVID and thought, I have to go to California. Like, literally nobody. The most COVID-crazed lunatic didn't do that, right? You just complained about it in Florida. So be it. No one did anything to you. Um, So I think that that'll be a a future problem that we're going to have to deal with. That as... As the migration, it's already happened. You know, New York lost about 400,000 people. Amer- I mean, Illinois as well. Yeah. So, but but the New York, no, Illinois is losing a ton. And it should, by the way. I mean, I went, I did my one of my book stops last May in Chicago. And it's an absolute dump. And you don't feel, I felt far safer uh, walking around in Judea and Samaria. And yeah. far safer walking around, certainly in Jerusalem, uh, in the Arab quarter than I felt in, definitely in San Francisco and definitely in Chicago. That, just simply a fact. It's just true. Um, but the, the states are just going to kind of do the, oh, the 400,000 in New York. So 400,000 people flee New York. Most of them ended up in Florida. Uh, Lee Zeldin lost by about 450,000 votes. Well, now we know it's not that every single one of those people was a Republican, but let's say 300,000 were, and then some of them were kids and whatever else. The point is the red have just gotten redder and the blue have just gotten bluer. There's nothing that's going to change that. 
any anytime soon. And if you look at Chicago, it's like you went from Lori Lightfoot, who was a complete leftist maniac right. who destroyed the city, and now you have an even worse person. And by the way, that's what right, and that's what they're doing in San Francisco. That's exactly what just happened in L.A. They got rid of Eric Garcetti, who was a progressive nutbag, bowing on his knees to BLM, and they got this uh, it's a Karen Bass or something who's even worse. So it's like. It's just not going to stop. And I think we just sort of have to accept that. So just one last yeah. question for you, because because you have to go to your next stop is uh, DeSantis. So both yeah. of us were at his event Thursday morning. Yeah. And he was very impressive. Yeah. Um, but he's being bashed by Trump. How do you see that competition between those two playing out for a Republican presidential well, nomination, assuming, as everybody does, that DeSantis is going to be announcing Yeah, I mean, he's, he's get. I don't have any information that anyone else doesn't have, but, like, there's no reason to think that it's not going to happen. So let's just go on the assumption that he's getting in. Look, I voted for Trump. I've interviewed Trump. I like Trump. I'm friendly with the kids. I like the family. Uh, his behavior in the last month with DeSantis has been absolutely insane and ridiculous. Now, I get it. He He's a fighter, and he wants to throw everything. His level of lies related to DeSantis and related to Florida have been so off the charts considering that he lives in Florida. His kids, two of his kids moved to Florida during COVID. All of his grandchildren live there. Um, he knows that Florida is basically the freest place on the face of the planet. And he's bashing Florida. He's calling DeSantis a rhino and a globalist. If DeSantis is a rhino and a globalist, then virtually every sane person is a rhino and a globalist because DeSantis is doing everything that every conservative would have ever wanted. There is nothing he hasn't set out to do and done. He, he literally is just doing the dominoes of accomplishing things. Mm -hmm. Trump knows he's the one guy that can beat him. I've never seen Trump's um, attacks been so erratic and crazy, and they're not working. And I, I did a debate about this a couple weeks ago in front of a couple hundred people with Rudy Giuliani, and Rudy sort of admitted it to me even that the attacks aren't working. To call, you know, like it's one, like, and also the name calling, people are just sick of it. I think people want competency, they want clarity, they want the, and communication. That's really what they want. And I think if DeSantis can stick to that, if he really can stick to that, hey, I'm not here to be your friend, I'm not here to be your father, I'm here to fix the country. I think there could be a Reagan-esque style resurgence in America, really model what freedom and competency is. But the fact that right now Donald Trump and MSNBC are on the same side, which they are, MSNBC every day ripping DeSantis left and right, and Trump is literally tweeting out MSNBC articles from Joy Reid about DeSantis, like, I, I, don't, I don't know what Trump's usefulness is at this point. He's not going to be president again. And maybe they're at this point just he's sort of in it with the lefty media. Like, OK, I'll, I'll you know, maybe can we cut some kind of like, I don't know that this is exactly right, but it feels something like this, whether whether literally or or figuratively. It's like he's cut a deal with them to basically be like, look, DeSantis is the threat. He's the, he's the one that can actually do all the stuff. I'm I know I'm not going to be president again, so I'll just help you take out the threat. and You guys will keep me out of jail or get off my Ooh. back or something like I know that's nuts. Sounds like Israeli actually sounds like our, yeah. our legal system here. Yeah. But does that but look also, you know, with, when you look at the last 10 years and how many conspiracy theories became true like two weeks later, does that sound that crazy? Like otherwise, what, like because there's such an easy solve right now. Imagine if Trump was just like, you know what? I was president. It didn't end up the way I wished it to end out. But here's this guy in Ron DeSantis in the state that I live in. He's doing an incredible job. I'll run the rallies. I'll help the guy. Like we would have the most unified Republican Party in the, probably in the history of America, possibly. Um, Biden is so weak. The Democrats are so weak. There's such an easy win for Republicans. Trump is going out of his way to say, I will not make it easy for Republicans. So what does that tell you? Well, I mean, it could tell you any number of things depending on where you sit, but you're right. Mostly, I think it tells you that he's an egomaniac. He's saying my quest for power and attention is more important than the country. Because if, if Trump drops out, and, and then makes, you know, makes amends with DeSantis, because he's, which he would have to because he's gone so deep on him and there is a cult-like thing with, with some of his base. It's like there's such an easy win there. If DeSantis drops out, you're still getting Biden as president or a Democrat like you're st because a certain amount of people just hate Trump. Whether that's warranted or not, we know what the ceiling is on Trump. If we're to believe the election last time, Trump got 75 million. Who is a new Trump voter? Where is it somebody that just saw, now they came around? Oh, yes, now I get it. I, Trump. It's like, no, but DeSantis actually, Elon Musk, lifelong Democrat, said he would vote for DeSantis. Joe Rogan, who is the biggest cultural influence in the United States, said he would vote for DeSantis. These guys did not vote for Trump. B Bill Maher, I went on his podcast, I got him to basically admit that if COVID ever came back, he would vote for DeSantis. I mean, that is massive. If you, the, Who can move in America, right? Like who right. electorally can move? 
it's the people that we've spent a lot of time talking about today. It's, it's the disaffected liberal that could actually say, I'm sort of a, a new conservative. I'm a, I'm a freedom loving, not, it doesn't mean I'm completely pro-life uh, and it doesn't mean I hate the gays or whatever they think it means, but it means I believe in America and I believe in freedom and those things. And I think there's so many obvious data points to prove that. I and and right. Trump just has to get out of the way, but but he's, you know. But is not. No, so maybe he gets what's sciatica. Your last, what's your last out. thoughts on Israel before you go to the state of Tel Aviv? <laughs> right? you, haven't, you haven't been to that well, side Well, I'm very yet, excited so like... for today because uh, I'm doing a couple interviews and then I'm going to the Knesset and Kevin McCarthy will be speaking at the Knesset. And I just interviewed him at the Capitol in America so just a few weeks ago. So that'll be a really nice, I think, connection for me personally and for my audience. Um, but really, you know, I sort of have a working thesis with my, my producer, Phoenix, who you met last night that we've been talking about this. Like, what are the things that these two countries can, can help each other with? Mm -hmm. and, and I think there is something that Israel can help America with. And we're trying to hash it out fully. And it does have a lot to do with some of the things we've talked about here, this, the push and pull between uh, modernity and history. And, uh, and what, what, you know, America's struggling because they've turned our melting pot against us. You know, we didn't have what Europe had, which, you know, basically it wasn't a melting pot. It, it became sort of like, oh, you're still this and that. And yeah, it says, well, it it says you're British on your passport, but, you know, you're kind of, America really did it. America really did it right. And now they've used that against us. And that may be happening here, too, with what you described between, let's say, Ashkenazi and Sephardic or religious and, and secular and all that. But there's still something here that is allowing it to be connected. And, and even the most, and this is what I want to find out, I suppose, when I'm in Tel Aviv, because I know plenty of people that are not, they're not yarmulke wearing, they're not, that live in Tel Aviv, uh, that are thought of as secular, but they still do the holidays, they yep. still do Shabbat. So, so there's still something culturally that I think has enough glue to like fix this thing here. Well, I think that was one of the myths that we grew yeah. up with in America, which was that the overwhelming majority of Israelis don't care about Judaism. That right. at the Yom Kippur War, they were all at the beach. This was a total fabrication yeah. that was told by I don't know whom, but you know the vast majority of Israelis are are very Jewish and what you would you know call more traditional. They right. light the candles on Shabbat. They yeah. they sit as families together and have holiday meals together. I mean all of those things. So right, right. it's a, it, that which is a far cry. So from, you say, think the that Israel Jew. can say to America, look, this is the model? I think that if Israel can. Get past this current situation. There'll always be situations here, like obviously, whether it's security or it's the internal stuff between the religious and the secular. But I think if they can figure out a way to piece some of this together, and maybe maybe I could be a little piece of that as I figure this out and bounce between these well, two maybe cities. Maybe a big piece. Maybe a big piece too, but a little piece would be fine. Then that sort of see we were able to get past something that looked like it was about to divide us because we figured out what our commonalities are. Maybe that would be a nice export to send to America because they are using our strengths against us. They, they are using the thing that brought more prosperity to more people from every walk of the planet. They are now using it against us. And I live in Miami. I live in Miami where, you know, I just did an event with the young Republicans and it's all Cubans and Venezuelans. And these people love freedom uh, because they are pretty freaking close to dictatorship and whether it was their parents or whatever. And, uh, they're giving me the signals. So I know, I know. They've been up, doing it for me, oh, too. Okay. They, they I, I moved was, away from yeah. me because they're like, she's <laughs> pretending she doesn't notice us. So anyway, Dave, thanks so much for yeah, coming to the pleasure. JNS studio and doing the Carolyn Glick show. I appreciate it. Yeah. And enjoy the rest of your trip in Israel and good luck with everything you're doing. And Thank I'll you. see you in two days. Yeah, we'll see you in two yeah. days. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Take care. Great. All right. Thank okay. you, guys. And we'll see you again uh, next week for another Carolyn Glick show. I don't think... We'll top Dave, but we'll do something and uh, make sure that you, uh, you are subscribed to this program and that uh, you're joining us again next week. Take care.